What's up, Active Lifers? Welcome back to the Active Life Podcast. Today, I am joined by my friend, Sarah Hayes, the owner and founder of Mindful Miles. She has a group where she started off by teaching people how to run because she wanted people to run with, and now she's built an entire community of empowerment that is rooted in a pillar of running and also supports people who aren't sure that they're ready to make that kind of commitment yet. I think what you're going to learn from this podcast is what the entrepreneurial journey really looks like from somebody who started on it about a year ago, a little bit less than a year ago, and has had great success, learned a lot from failures, and is ready to share both with you. I hope you enjoy. Sarah Hayes, welcome to the Active Life Podcast. Thanks for having me. My <laughs> pleasure. Uh, I would love for you to share. Uh, actually, I'm going to share my side of this story first. Then you can share your side of the story. Okay. All right. So the first time that we met, do you remember this? Absolutely. Right. I'm walking home and I'm talking into my camera like I often do. I get almost to the end of my driveway and I hear, hey, are you a coach? And then we, we start a conversation. Turns out you live behind me, but I would love for you to share where, where the um, impetus to start a conversation there came from. Yeah, it's, it's so funny. I was thinking about this yesterday because I am a relatively outgoing person, but I don't just talk to people. Mm -hmm. um, I had just finished a run, so thanks, runner's high, I guess. I see this guy walking at me, and I'm like, oh, he's FaceTiming or something, like whatever. Let's get a little closer to the mic. Um, and... I, I walk past you and I don't even know what you said, but it was absolutely like coach vernacular, like sign up today or something. And I was like, shit, I know that. I know that language. I've mm -hmm. been that. So I'm like, all right, I got, I got to introduce myself to this guy. I got to know because I did not grow up in New York. I'm actively trying to find, you know, people in my community, people like me. And so I'm like, all right, this guy's clearly one of my neighbors. I have to say hi. So I'm like, how do I do this and be the least creepy and I did it and was the most creepy. <laughs> so I just like followed you and was like, all right, well now he's walking into his backyard. So I have to say something and I am on your property and I'm just like, Hey, uh, <laughs> you coach. <laughs> so that, that is my side of the story. Well, that's, 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 it gets. <laughs> that's the classic. Don't think of a pink elephant. Or he's like, don't, don't be creepy. Don't be creepy. Don't be creepy. And then you, yeah, it was I creepy. If it makes you feel any better, I wasn't creeped out by it. I didn't know you had stalked me for, uh, what was it, seven blocks, you said? <laughs> it was like two houses. <laughs> well, anyway, so it's wild to me that you live right behind me, that you're in a, uh, a similar business model to what we are, and that you, you're generating your revenue online, you're, mm -hmm. you're living life by your own terms. I would love to hear the story that you told me about what you were doing before and how all of a sudden you end up starting Mindful Miles. Yeah. How far back do you want me to go? Uh, childhood. Okay. No, I was start, thinking infancy, you can, but you, can start you want with, me to fast forward. You can start with like five minutes before COVID. Okay. So I was working for a tech startup. Um, before that, I was working in sports, and this was the first nine-to-five job I'd ever had. It was incredible. Like, the people were nice. They went home at 5 o'clock on the dot. They had work-life balance. They had mm -hmm. hobbies. Like, they rock climbed. And I was like, what are you guys doing? You have, you have hobbies? So anyways, I had time on my hand. At the time, I, was, um, I did social media on the side for, um, like, restaurants, bars, things like that. Nothing I was really interested in, but it was easy for me, and I wanted to fill the free time. Was this in New York, or was this in New Mexico? Yes, yeah, it was in New York. Okay. Um, I was living in Long Beach at the time, and then, like we all know, we get shut down March, February time frame. I'm working from home, and I was just feeling really lonely, really craving community, and was like, I don't, I don't know what to do here. So I went on a run, and on the run, I had the idea of... I mean, people train virtually all the time. I wonder if we could do something like that where, I don't know, I just like wrote training plans for a 5K or something, and then we had a virtual race. So I put it up on my social media, which was just a personal page at the time. I was probably posting pictures of like coffee. I don't even know. And I said, if I write plans for a 5K, let's say eight weeks, does anyone want to do it with me? And I was so nervous because I was like, I can't be one of those like, Instagram people like no one's gonna say yes this is gonna be so embarrassing and then I remember like 50 people said yes and I was blown out of my socks so I was like all right well 
what do I do now? So I kind of created the model for the different groups and how they would self-identify and what their goals would be. And I remember looking at my then fiance, now husband, and saying, I think there could be something here. And it was a really weird full circle moment for me because my whole life I've loved running and I've only ever wanted to work in that space. But I've, I'm like this unique in-between person where it's like I could be a big fish in a little pond or a little fish in a big pond, but I'm never going to be the big fish in the big pond. And so I say that because I was a good runner, but if I ever tried to go professional, I would have been bottom of the barrel and it just wouldn't have worked. And at the time, I thought that was the only way that sport could be my career. So now for this to be a thing, I was like, oh my God, okay. So this was March, I don't know. And I set the goal. I said, by the end of the year, I want to make the decision to keep this as like a passion project, side hustle, or go full time. Like, we're not going to draw this out. It's like six, seven months, whatever. And by the end of the year, we got to know. And this is 21. This is 21. We got married in November. December, I don't know, first week of December, our CEO calls an all hands meeting and says, hey guys, tomorrow's your last day, we're folding. And I was so calm because I was like, well shit, I guess this is my sign, I gotta do it. Um, and we've, I've been full time ever since. It's that work-life balance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I gave you guys too much balance. <laughs> right. uh, so, so that was the moment where, well, you didn't have to do it. No. Right, because because I mean, at that moment, you could be like, okay, well, I can probably collect unemployment for a little bit and figure out where I want to be and what I want to do. Mm-hmm. What made you decide I'm gonna write running plans and run groups and? Yeah. So ultimately, what it was for me is and I didn't have to do it. So we were about to close on our house mm-hmm. and going through the motions of like, okay, amazing neighbors, by I, the way. So yeah. A little weird, but yeah. it's fine. <laughs> it's a lot um, weird. I was going through the motions of, okay, now we have to figure out how to take myself off of the home application because I'm unemployed. Like we mm-hmm. had, to, we had to figure out that madness and it hits a lot of insecurities. Like, you know, it, for me it was, it was nuts. And so I applied for a ton of jobs. I got interviews with these incredible companies doing work that I would have like jumped through the roof to do in the past. And I just, felt so uninterested and so deflated. And like, I knew in my heart that if I went and I worked for a stable company with a great name or a great paycheck, it would have just been abandoning what I needed to do. And it was my husband who was just like, if money weren't a thing, what would you do? And I'd be like, I'd tell all these interviewers to leave me alone. Mm -hmm. He's like, so do that. Um, It's a good husband. Yeah, he's a good guy. I mean, I, I definitely wouldn't be here without him because he is, I remember even like, on our honeymoon, he comes out of the shower and he's like, my miles could easily be a million dollar business. I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, and at the time it was like, I don't know, eight week plans for 20 bucks or something. Mm-hmm. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, it's simple math, Sarah. All you, and I'm like, what? You're nuts. And all these years later, it was like, every time I doubt myself, he's just there like whispering in the background, like, you want to do this, keep doing this. And so it's, uh, it is a really great balance that we have because I am, I am the dreamer and he is the, the kind of guy that keeps me the stable. pragmatist. Yeah. So I want to go back to that first, uh, that first post when 50 people said that they were in. Mm-hmm. One of the things that uh, I'm not sure you've had the, the luxury of experiencing yet, I'm joking, I'm sure you have, is when... 50 people say, yeah, I want to do that. And then you're like, okay, cool. We're going to do it on this day at this time. And then they're like, oh, <laughs> and then they're gone. Yeah. And three of them show up. Mm-hmm. So just because 50 people said, yeah, I would do that. doesn't mean that 50 people would do it. How did that convert from, I'm going to write these plans to now you have this group of 50. How many of them actually became part of your first 50? Let's say. Probably 80%. A ton because think about it. It was a twenty dollar plan. There was really not high stakes, and we had nothing else to do. Mm-hmm. There was nothing else to do. So everyone was like, "Well, shit! Like, I may as well." So that was the biggest gift for me is because I had this massive beta group, and I was like, "Well, what do you guys want?" And this was it was so bare bones. Like mm-hmm. I spent. I spent too much time in Photoshop every Sunday trying to make these like cute training plans and then emailing them out. Um, and that's not where I'm at right now, but that's kind of, it, it was really cool to have that group 
and then to say, all right, I want to do this again. Let's iterate. Let's up the distance. You get to choose the distance. You get to choose the goal and we'll go from there. And what did happen was people did drop off. So 50 went to maybe 30, 30 went to maybe 20. But when I was able to tell that this could be a viable business was when every time we iterated, there was less people, but we made more money. Mm -hmm. And we still have that like core group of like day oneers that were just like, yeah, I, I consider myself a runner right now because of Mindful Miles. So what you're describing, I want to make sure I'm, I'm appropriately understanding it. You went from 50 people at 20 bucks to maybe 40 people at 50 bucks. 50 bucks. Yeah. But so, so the program kept on getting more and more um, in-depth, mm-hmm. more, more full circle supportive. Mm-hmm. And the people who in the beginning were like, yeah, give me a program and I'll, I'll like follow it whenever, mm-hmm. kind of, maybe, sure. Yeah. They were like, all right, I don't actually have a $50 problem to solve, so this is not for me. Good luck. Mm-hmm. Where are you at now? Like what, what is, what is the program now? Yeah, the program is much more high touch. So I do group and I do one-on-one. We're actually getting ready to launch a membership for the folks that don't want training plans, but they want community. Um, and what it is, is the group is just folks that are looking to redefine their relationship with running or have it for the first time. They maybe have a bitter taste in their mouth for it from sports, from family members, from bad body image, whatever that is for them. And they come to Mindful Miles not because they want to go out and run a BQ or run, you know, run a, a, what? a Boston qualifying time. Mm, Sorry. That, yeah, that um, was definitely vernacular. Right yeah, that. that was. As it came out, I was like, eh, <laughs> I hate when people do that. Um, but they don't, they don't come to me because they are already these crazy athletes looking to, you know, hit their max potential. I have a couple like that and that's great, but that's not why they came to me at first. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's, we do, it's much more holistic now. Whereas before it was just, I don't know what I'm doing guys. I'm figuring out. You want to figure it out with me, go out and run, give me feedback. Let me know what you thought. Whereas now I almost struggle to call myself a running coach because Like, that's just the sign on the door. We Mm -hmm. work on so much more than running, but you have to start somewhere. And so for me, that is the pillars. We start with running, and then we look to include other types of movement so that you can really build build out your tool belt of the things that you like. Because even me, lifelong runner, love the sport. I do not run year round. So no, Um, like right now I'm in my fun run season, which means I've ran like twice in the past two weeks, Mm -hmm. but I really enjoy yoga. I love rowing. I love strength training. And I think it's really important because I've gone through times in my life where I've struggled to call myself a runner because I don't run five days a week all year round. But I do other things that contribute to that that help me be a strong runner when I want to be in that season. So that's what we focus on too is it's like, okay, let's develop that base and then let's acknowledge that you may fall out of love with it for a week, a month, a season. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do in the meantime? Because you can't do nothing. We've all acknowledged that we are better people when we're moving our bodies. So what, what does that level of intensity look like for you? Well, one of the things I find interesting about what you're describing is you're describing that there's a group of people who are now coming to you who don't even want running plans. Yep. What what does that mean? Like what? So, so I I don't under, this is something that I actually uh, struggle to do. Personally, so I'm, I'm fortunate to have other people who are good at doing this, in charge of it. You're talking about creating community amongst people who don't even want the core product from you. What, is, what do they show up on a Zoom call and say, hey, I'm Jane. I hate <laughs> yeah. running. Yeah, I think it's because, so some people come to me for that reason and they're like, Like a running plan sounds cool, but everything else you're selling is really why I'm here. And Mm -hmm. it's for me, it's that repeated repetitive action of running where it's like you start out and you're like, this sucks. Okay, this feels uncomfortable. Is my form right? What's going on? My breathing feels heavy. And then it's it's that like slowly then all at once where you wake up one day and you really enjoyed that run. And so for me, it's less about, okay, this is the plan and you have to stick to it more like, I want you to go out there and I want you to get uncomfortable. If you like listening to music, I want you to go a week without it and just see what happens. Mm -hmm. Because we don't put ourselves in places of discomfort often. So I'm not saying go out there and run until you puke. All I'm saying is take your earbuds out. 
listen right. to your breathing, what's see what happens. What's the benefit of that? What are the things that people see happen? They're in, like insanely more mindful. They're able to say, oh, maybe I'm getting injured because I'm going too fast all the time because I'm listening to house music at 7 a.m. Mm-hmm. and my heart rate is like 180. Um, and they're able to, I mean, if you think about it, we have every opportunity to have stimulus. You wake up, you look at your phone, you look at your notifications, you play music, you listen to a podcast, you turn the TV on, you're driving to work, you call a friend, you have the radio on. But when do we schedule like a quiet time? When do we schedule time to just let our thoughts come up and see what's going on? Mm-hmm. We don't. And so I've had people that are terrified when I tell them that. And I'm like, listen, my job as a coach is to give you the platter. I want you to try everything. A poo-poo platter? Yes, a poo-poo platter. <laughs> <laughs> I used to love going to Chinese restaurants oh, and the, the poo-poo platter. That, I mean, I think it was just like the word to like be a child and be part able to it, order poo-poo platter and not get was, in trouble for it. Part of it, it was also putting <laughs> yeah. the meat on top of the fire and being yeah. like, I'm cooking this. I'm, I'm camping right now. Yeah, but so let's, let's go back to you. <laughs> um, so I say, I just want you to try it. And some people can't get there and that's totally fine because we've planted the seed. And so maybe it's not today. Maybe next year, maybe in two years, you're ready to try it again. Mm-hmm. And that's, I think that is the point of a coach is most people come to a coach because they want to be somewhere in 30, 60, 90 days. That's great. But the way that I look at a coach is we give the clients, the athletes, whatever you call them, the people that we work with tools so that when they are 70, 80, 90, they know what to do. They hear your voice in the back of their head guiding them and saying, this is what you need to do. This is, you know, they give you that kind of parameters. And that's, I think, the most important piece of it. What is one example of something that you would like somebody to be hearing in their 70s, 80s, and 90s that you said to them in their 30s? Or that they learned from you in their 30s? I I love that question. Yeah, so for me, it's, I want to hear from someone that they just went on a run, they laced up and they did it and they had a great time. Not that they were following a rigid plan. There's seasons for that and that's totally fine. But if I'm working with someone right now that's 30 or 40, I tell them specifically, I want to hear from you when you're older because I want to know that you're still moving because I want to know that this means something to you. The people that I work with mainly are coming from being burnt out over-exercising, doing these insane challenges or cleanses or whatever. And so when they come to Mindful Miles, they are so burnt out on booty challenges and things like that. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, do you want to do a booty challenge when you're 90? Like, maybe, that's fine. But the way that I look at it is sustainability. And so I want you to have a sustainable practice. So I'm not saying work out the same, but have something that's yours and that you can always pull out of your toolbox no matter how old you are. What are some things that you've pulled out of running that, that have nothing to do with running, mm-hmm. but that you, you learned on a run, for example, without your headphones on? I mean, all my best business ideas come from runs. But I think, especially looking back at this past season, because I'm, I'm just coming out of a very rigid training cycle. I, I just finished a marathon build. Crushed it, by and the way. I did. It was awesome. Um, I'm also um, a new mother. This is the first race that I've really trained for since having my son. And I really struggled to develop my why throughout the training cycle. So I speak to runners. I don't know what you do with your athletes, but a big thing in the running community is to really hone in on your why. Because if you're going to go out and run for two, three, four, five, six hours, you got to know why you're doing it because it's pretty nuts. Mm -hmm. So your why for that, not your like, big why you're like why am i running why am i doing this okay and i really struggled because it was like i like marathons like i think it's cool and it came full circle for me because i realized i'm struggling to find my why because the goal that i'm holding on to for this race was the goal that i had when i initially qualified for it in 2019 Mm -hmm. i was not married i was not a mother i was not a business owner a lot's changed and i i failed to recognize that and so for me when i look back at it i would have absolutely lost myself to being a new mother if i did not force that space if i did not make sure i went out and i got the time in to run to lift to do pt whatever that was because if there wasn't this goal at the finish line i would have just been like oh it's fine the baby needs me And Mm -hmm. so I think that's where the run has saved me in many aspects because it reminds me to put myself first. 
And I don't have many other areas in my life where I would be like, no, I'm putting myself first today. The, mm-hmm. run, the run really reminds me of that because if you don't do it, which is fine, there's been t- plenty of times when I've missed a run, but if you don't, you know what those opportunity costs are, okay? Increased risk of injury, you may have to pull back the mileage, you know, there's all these different things. Whereas if it's like, okay, I wanted to go for a run today or I wanted to go to the gym, but you know, the baby needs me. So I guess I just won't today and I will tomorrow. It's harder to see that opportunity cost of, okay, if I don't give myself 30, 60, 90 minutes of undefined me time where I can listen to music if I need to, unplug if I want to, let my thoughts come up, how am I going to show up as a mother or a wife or a business owner or a friend to other people if I'm continually neglecting to put myself first? So it really just, it it helped me with boundaries. That's cool. Have you been able to expand that outside of you and yourself? Meaning, have you been able to say, I set a boundary for myself with myself that I am going to give myself 30, 60, 90 minutes. Then you go into the world and everybody is asking of you. Mm -hmm. From your child to your husband to your parents maybe to your friends to your coworkers to your clients. Have you found that you've been able to take that and extrapolate it into into that world? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's because um, I was actually talking about this with a client last week is she, she's a new client and she came into our call so flustered. She was like, I'm just like, I bit everyone's head off today. It's one of those days where it's like you hear your coworker chewing and mm-hmm. you just want to smack them. And I was like, that's so interesting. How long has it been since you've done anything for you? Not just run, just anything for you. She's like, maybe a week. I'm like, mm-hmm. So when we get to that place where we're like, I can't, like, I can't take care of me, that's fine. But you and everyone else is going to suffer from it. So yes, the run has definitely taught me that because I I go into the day more level headed where it's just like, okay, y'all are coming at me with some shit right now. Like one thing at a time. And uh, I have, I have 10 minutes for this. What can I help you with? And then once the 10 minutes are up, it's like, it's on the calendar. I got to move on. This is, you know, if, if something really needs more time, that's fine. But it's really given me that space to draw strong lines. So let's, let's pivot a little bit from running to entrepreneurship. Because if I'm not mistaken, this is your first round at it. I mean, I've been doing this since I was like eight, but first round at it. Yeah. With like money at stake. Well, tell me what you've been doing <laughs> since you're eight. Um, So I grew up in a restaurant. My mom owned an Italian restaurant growing up. And I would take the pizza dough and make these god-awful desserts. Mm -hmm. And it was in a shopping center. So I would go, my brother and I would go to all the different shopping centers and sell them. And then uh, that evolved to, so New Mexico has something called the Balloon Fiesta. So it's International Balloon Fiesta, the largest thing ever. It's so cool if you ever get a chance to go to New Mexico. Hot air balloon? Hot air balloons. Um, and one thing that they do is, you know, they have the merch tents. A lot of people will sell pins of their balloons. It's like a collector's thing. I don't mm-hmm. know. Well, we crewed for a balloon, which just means you help the balloon go up, you help it go down. And this balloon had pins that they just gave away to people. So I was like, well, these pins are free, but people will go over here and pay $10. So I would just walk up to people and be like, hey, um, I've got pins if you want for three bucks. And uh, I got in a lot of trouble for that. But I remember uh, someone was just like, you're quite the entrepreneur, aren't Why'd you? Why'd you get in trouble for it? Because they were supposed to be for free and it was supposed to just be like a nice thing and I was profiting off of it. Did you get in it. trouble with your mom or did you get in trouble with someone at the, at the, fie- at my the mom, fiesta? My mom, who's okay. also an entrepreneur. Right. But like, was she like, you got in a lot of trouble. How much money did you make? Right. She's like, hey, <laughs> half. I drove you here. Right, right, right. <laughs> but I remember that was like, I was the first time I've ever heard the word entrepreneur and I was like, well, what does that mean? Because I just had a lot of fun doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, that's my whole life. I found those little missing links where it's like, Oh, there's a need. We can we can ser- service that need, and this is what the price is going to be. Right. So, so this is your first business. Business, yeah. When you were working in corporate America, did you have an intrapreneurial kind of job, or was it more of a 
this is these are your KPIs. This is the team you work on. This is your role within the team. You contribute to a bigger thing. How did that work? Yeah, it was it was the latter. So okay. um, did that I, feel constraining for you? Absolutely, and that's why. So the side gigs, the social media work I did that I mentioned earlier, I had had that job since college, and I just kept it with me because so I was like, it's easy cash every month. Um, what kind of cash are we talking about? I think it was like 500 bucks a month Not bad for in college. college yeah. yeah. Um, but I never raised prices on them. So yeah, but look, I mean, I, I remember <laughs> college, we had drinking with Lincoln. You, you yeah. walk in, you pay $10 and then it was a penny for a beer. Yeah, no, I wasn't. So $500 gets you a long way. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a good uh, cut. Um, yeah. All of the jobs were very rigid. I remember in my first job, it was with a professional sports team. I joined a meeting And I was so green and I was so excited to be in that meeting. And we were talking about postseason and I had some ideas of like activations we could do, fan engagement, things like that. And um, everyone in the meeting was getting so excited and so riled up. And so that was naturally riling me up and we were just riffing and bouncing ideas off. I left the meeting feeling so empowered. And my boss called me into her office like an hour later and was like, you don't speak in meetings. Like you, you cannot do that. Like we, we got off course. Now they want to do all of these things. And I was, I felt so much shame and I held that with me for years. So after that, I just looked for shit safe jobs because I was like, okay, I have to stay in my lane. If I want to do anything crazy, it's going to be a side hustle or something like that, where someone just says, go to town on my social media, Mm -hmm. let them know it's like 50 cent wing night. Um, and then I kind of got tired of being in sports. It's long hours. It's not the best pay. It's a lot of fun, but you get, you get over it pretty quickly. So keep your mouth shut. (laughs) Yes. Don't (laughs) say anything. We do the same three things every year. Free shirt Friday. That's it. Um, but then I, I've always had this urge to start my own business. That's I've always wanted to do that. I never knew what it was though. So I would say it to people and they'd be like, well then go start your own business. Mm -hmm. I I constantly thinking, okay, maybe consulting. Nobody really understands social media. Maybe I could do that. Maybe, you know, I was constantly. And then I found the, the listing for my last employer. It was a tech startup in the education space, all kinds of things that I was interested. It was the perfect mix of marketing and sales and sponsorship and things that just kind of come naturally to me. And it was a startup. So they were like, do whatever you want. It's a startup. Mm -hmm. You get to have 18 jobs and we'll pay you for one. And that's where it was really exciting for me to be creative in the workspace, throw things at the wall, see what sticks, get celebrated for failing Mm -hmm. because eventually that's going to be a big win. And it was. And so I, what do you mean? How, How was it a big win for you to get celebrated for failing? Because the more you try, the more you figure things out. Mm -hmm. And so you don't win on the first try. So if you, I don't know, um, like for me, it was like a horrible sales call. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, they're not all going to be great, but you have to learn from them. So look at your notes. Eventually it's going to be a great sales call and you're going to be with working with bigger partners. So, that was exciting for me. And I got that was to your play. self-talk or that was a talk that your, your bosses would share Both. with you? That was my bosses. They would just be like, go out there. Like we want you fail fast, go out there. The first like month, they didn't want me working. They were like, we just want you to ask questions, observe, absorb everything. And I was like, absolutely not. You're going to fire me. Like, <laughs> I know that's a trick. Um, but it was incredible. And it really, it made me realize I was walking with all these like former wounds of like, you can't sell things. You can't speak out of turn. You can't be an entrepreneur. And so, you know, I finally got to the place where I felt really comfortable in that company. And I realized I love the work. I'm just not passionate about the industry. Mm-hmm. And then that was like the perfect culmination of, well, now you're working at home. Now you have tons of time in the day and now you don't have a job. Yeah. Those things line up. <laughs> so when we first started talking, I mean, what was this like? May? Yeah. Something Early like summer. Yeah, yeah, it was like May, June. Yeah. So let's just call that five months ago is when we first actually met. You, For people who don't understand Long Beach, um, being neighbors means like if I, if I want to be intrusive, I just say hi when Sarah walks into the backyard. Yeah. Right? Our properties touch. <laughs> right. Our backyards abut. And I remember um, <clears throat> Kim came to me one day and she's like, 
he's trimming the bushes and I think he doesn't know that like this is going to grow in the, in the, in the spring and it's going to give us a little bit of privacy. Not that I don't like them, but like, is it, is, is it mean if I say like, Hey, please don't cut that bush and let's just wait until spring and see. <laughs> like, it's like that. Right. And he um, was just so excited to finally have a bush to trim. Like, I get it. Print plant stuff. I mean, don't look at our backyard right now. There's a lot of weird things going on. I but. get it. I get it. <laughs> um, but, th- but so, so like, you know, we're talking about, I live on a 60 foot by 100 foot parcel. It's not acreage. Um, we're close. And when we first met, you were, you were kind of like, I got a sense of excitement from you. They're like, I'm doing this thing for myself. It's really cool. I'm really enjoying it. Um, and almost like a sense of, it would be really cool if, if you thought that was cool, not that you were looking to impress me. That's not what I'm implying Mm -hmm. at all, but like, Oh, there's some commonality with somebody who's local to me and I can talk about things that nobody else would understand. Mm -hmm. Like if I say, Hey, I put this into my story. They're like, yeah, that's, that's weird. I don't know what that means. (laughs) Um, what story you wrote a book, right? Exactly. (laughs) So, so, and for the record, I felt that too, right? It's, it's, it's being an entrepreneur can be a lonely thing because regardless of if you're in your first six months of business or you're 15 years in, unless if you're talking to other people who are doing what you're doing, people don't understand what you're doing. Yeah. Most people have a job. Mm-hmm. Um, in that moment, you were telling me basically the goal was replace my salary mm-hmm. and I'll be, I'll be good. Mm-hmm. So that was step one. Right. And that got done. Mm-hmm. But you run in launches. Is that correct? Not anymore. But when I met you, I had. OK, so mm-hmm. why did you change that? I and before you do, actually, the difference between a launch and a recurring membership for people who are listening is a launch would be if Sarah said every March, June, September and December or January, we we will roll out admissions, mm-hmm. if you will. Mm-hmm. And that's the money that you make for the next three months. Correct. And every three months, you can now have a marketing campaign that leads up to this big day and launch, and hopefully more people come than last time. Mm-hmm. Why'd you stop doing that? So it's not just me anymore, but at the time it was just me, and it was a lot. I could not get myself organized enough to figure out the marketing plan ahead of the launch and all of the behind the scenes things. But more than anything, it was really hard for me because people would come to me and say, Hey, sir, I'm really interested in working with Mindful Miles. And then I'd be like, cool, come back to me in three months. Come Mm -hmm. back to me in a month. We're about to launch. Some of them would wait, and that's really cool. But most of them were like, no, I I want my problem solved right right now. Um, (laughs) My two-thirds. I don't want a three-month appointment. Exactly. And so I just felt like I was doing an injustice to the community by saying, you have to, we have to stick to this rigid plan. There's strength and launches because you have the cohorts there's people that are all in it together you feel like you're really part of the team so now that it's open enrollment and you can join whenever it's a little bit more work for me to Mm -hmm. familiarize them with the company and the brand and the other people that are in in the group um but i just was getting so burnt out from having a three-month session and then getting ready to launch again to really saying like, I want this to be more than three months. And the feedback that I was getting from the women that I work with was this needs to be longer than three months. Like three months is cool. And a lot of people were like, great, this is exactly what I needed. Now I can go off on my own and maybe, you know, maybe at the end they would come back in the future or they would want to um, upgrade to one-on-one services. But it was really that they were just looking for the community to be a part of And it was like the training plans were great because that gave me the structure I needed to start my runs. But how do I stay in the community? And there wasn't really an answer for them. Mm -hmm. So that's when I kind of paused everything and said, this is going to be the last launch. This is going to be the last group. But really, I'm going to shift to this model of whenever you raise your hand, if it's a good fit for both of us, you can come into the room. And have you liked that so far? (sighs) I I have. Um, it's definitely harder to generate conversations because I'm not selling. Right, like, you're I'm not building not, to the urgency all the time. No. And I definitely do see, because there isn't a deadline, because you can join whenever, there's definitely less people in the room because they're like, oh, maybe in two months then. So mm-hmm. I'm getting it in reverse now. Right. But it feels more authentic to me. I don't like, it made me really uncomfortable to be like, you have, we start Monday deadlines Mm -hmm. today. You got to sign up. 
Because what's the difference if they mm-hmm. started a week later than everyone else? Well, in a lot of ways, uh, and I mean this in an, an agnostic way, it's a selfish decision. Absolutely. Right? And, and yeah. that's, that's not to shame selfishness. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I champion selfishness yeah. on a regular basis. It's I need to organize my business in such a way that you enroll when I say it's Absolutely. time. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and I that has... Go on. You want that dopamine hit of like, I just had a 10, 15, 20K launch, whatever that yeah. looks like, because if they enroll next month, well, that doesn't count towards this launch. Right. It's like, well, is that in their best interest? Right. Like, what if they're not, what if they're traveling for the next month and you're going to make them try and start a fitness routine while they're in Italy? Mm-hmm. Like, that's not fair to anyone. Uh, the dopamine hit, oh man. <laughs> you're bringing me back to, uh, I remember when I first went online. When I got out of clinical practice in January of 2018, and there was really no money sitting there waiting for me. It wasn't wasn't like I was stepping into a business. I just was giving up what I had for the chance of pursuing something that maybe I could Mm -hmm. build with the help of some other people. Mm -hmm. Um, And I remember one week, and this was in 2019 maybe? had to be 2019. Uh, I turned to Kim. And I was like, I just, I just did a twenty thousand dollar week. Like I now, now I know what it takes to do a million dollar year. Mm-hmm. Because if I can do a twenty thousand dollar week, and now I can repeat this fifty times, mm-hmm. I, we can take a two week vacation and we can generate a million dollars. Now, what I didn't know anything about at the time was what it costs to serve that, right? Yeah. Uh, how the business needed to change and all of that. But I remember the dopamine hit of being like, yeah. I made fire. I just have to go do it again. Yes. That's it. All I, I just tell people that the doors are open and they're yes. going to send me money. And yes. it's like, oh, that's so sweet. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so you said it's not just you anymore. Mm-hmm. There's a, a we now. And one of the things I remember we discussed early on was who's the first person you hire? I'm like, I, it depends. Like there's so many questions. So who was the first person you decided to hire? The first person I hired was a VA. It was not the best decision. Mm -hmm. And it's because I wasn't in a place to onboard her. Um, I did not create a framework for her to be successful. She's still with me, but it's on a very part-time capacity because I'm just like... I need to teach someone how to manage me and I can't even manage myself right now. Is it a part-time capacity because you just don't have the heart to fire her? No, no, no. I mean, I just... I don't have the work for her right now. Um, And... Once once the membership is launched and we have a couple of other things going, she'll be great at what I need her to do. Mm-hmm. But she's just like, I think the company's cool. I'll hang out. Tell me when you have work for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've definitely been in that situation too where it's like, I don't think this is a good fit. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid to fire you. So instead, I'm going to let you stay here for much longer mm-hmm. and we're both going to be unhappy about it. And then <laughs> you're either going to quit or I'll fire you. I made a post that said... Uh, <laughs> Sometimes firing someone can be the most empathetic thing that you do. And my inbox filled up with people who were not happy with that post. There were all people that got fired. There were people that got fired or people who um, know someone who got fired or just people who were able to put themselves in the seat of what they think it feels like mm-hmm. to get fired. And, yep. and you know, we're in this, this world right now where I think a lot of people are trying to solve the problems of other people that they're not personally experiencing. Uh, and I understand the idea of trying to stand up for somebody else. I respect that. I, I love that people do it. I think right now, a lot of what I got in my inbox was like, I'm like, dude, did you talk to the person who I most recently had to fire? Mm-hmm. Did, did you have a conversation with them? Yeah. Did you know that one of the people who recently got fired actually had sent me a thank you letter months later because their life is better and Set they're, yep. they're doing something that they really love? Um, no. So how about you shut the fuck up? But well, and that's so funny because I forget what the quote is or even if there even is one, but it's like you look back at the hardest times in your life mm-hmm. and then you now with perspective you're able to see all that you are now because of it. And so you wouldn't trade that in for the world. Well that depends on how you adapt Well how you look it, at it. Right? Yeah, so yeah, I, I forget who I heard talking about this recently, but it was so it was good. Oh, who was it? Damn it. Um they were talking about the idea that we have trauma in our lives. Most people have trauma and, and the worst thing that's ever happened to you is the worst thing that's ever happened to you. Mm-hmm. What ends up happening is we either take that and say, I'm going to be stronger for this or we take that and we say, how dare that person do this to me? Now I'm a victim. Mm-hmm. And you hold that person you know, in, in this high regard with all this power, this person, this entity, this idea, whatever it is, 
as opposed to saying like, Hey, I learned some really valuable lessons over there. I don't have to like that person or that entity or that idea to yeah. know that I'm better for it. I'm exhausted just from hearing you say that. Cause I'm like, wow, that's a lot of it's energy lot. to hate someone. Like, that lot. is a lot to hold on to. It is. <laughs> um, but so who, who else be, is, is there anyone else besides the VA now? So we've got the VA. Um, obviously we share a mentor now. Right. Um, and I have hired two coaches to mm-hmm. work under me that I'm really excited about. That's cool. Um, we're in the process of onboarding them and they're building out their own little space within the business and what they want it to be. And it's, it's really exciting to go from, I'm still the coach for clients and athletes, mm-hmm. but to be the coach for coaches now. Mm-hmm. Um, Oh, it's so much fun. It, I love it, it is, right? It's so fun. So we share a mentor in Ken. Has he had to talk to you about what your what your job is as the owner now who has two employees? No, we haven't gotten there yet. Okay. <laughs> I'll leave it for him. All right, sounds good. Uh, for those of you listening, though, I'd love for you to share with me what you believe the responsibility of the owner of a business is. What is the job, what is the key role of the owner of a business? Go ahead and send me a DM at Dr. Sean Pesuch on Instagram, and we'll yeah. have a conversation about it. I want to see what that is. We can talk about it after. Very cool. Now it's for them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm not in on this one. <laughs> well, so, so, so I, what I, what I remember when I first started hiring employees, I wasn't hiring employees. I was hiring 1099s because I didn't want to have to go through the hassle of hiring and all the, all the young business decisions that have changed over time. Anyway, I remember one night having an epiphany that, I'm not worried about making enough money for myself anymore. But I'm worried about making enough money for them. Mm -hmm. And now it's a different kind of responsibility where their problems are magnified as my problems. So I now only, not only have my problems, I have their problems, which includes their family their friends, their social life, their lessons that they've learned before. And I need to mentor these people in such a way that they feel safe and that they feel, you know, mentored. You can't just pat them on the back all the time. And I mean, I'm not sure what your business model is completely, but like, and able to take risks because. Well, that's the safety part. Yeah. Starting a new job is taking a risk and. Yeah, that's uh, interesting because I also feel that way. But hearing you say it, I'm like, that sounds like a lot, man. I it don't is know. a lot. It's, look, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I'll give you yeah. an example. Um, we have a phenomenal. We have. I'm really, really, really happy and proud of the team that we have. There's 32, I think, now who nice. are working at Active Life, and we are opening our flagship location now, which is the brick and mortar that is meant to be the shining example of the industry needs this, Mm -hmm. the market wants this. Mm -hmm. And if we deliver well, not only will it be financially successful, but we will open a world up to a group of people who don't have options right now. In order to do that, our staff needs to be exceptional. Like that staff needs to be the, you know, green berets, Navy seals, pick your favorite metaphor for Mm -hmm. excellence. Mm -hmm of training. We believe that a training session goes beyond the workout. If you just give someone a good workout, like you're, you're imminently replaceable. And so there's a lot of education that gets baked into the training that we give to clients. The trainers who are executing that training right now are trainers who we've mentored for, you know, 13 to 18, no, for about 18 months Mm -hmm. respectively. And, the way I described it to one of them this morning was you were the best player in the minor leagues, the best. Mm-hmm. We knew we wanted to bring you up to the pros. And part of the plan was to have you sit behind this future hall of famer and observe and, and grow. He's hurt. You're in. You're up. Right. So yeah. there's a level of development. I mean, I can share with you that, Last night, one of the coaches on staff was studying from about 4 p.m. until about 10 p.m. Educational content that he already knows but needs to be able to deliver in a way. And then woke up this morning, came in early before a session and drilled it again before he told it to a client. What I'm describing and needing to be both supportive and stern is, hey, if you want to give that session tomorrow, this needs to be on point. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, and having them know like, okay, well, I'm, I want to give that session tomorrow. I know that this person respects me. I will drill what I need to do to get it done. Yeah. 
That's awesome. I mean, it's it's it sounds like you empower your employees to kind of carve out their own space in which whatever their style is going to be, but also remember that they are ambassadors of the Active Life brand. Mm -hmm. So whatever you do, it needs to be with major league quality. Like if you prefer to describe something this way, that's fine. That's your vernacular. But it always has to come back to active life in the way that we decide our clients should feel when they leave the room. Yeah. And and I should add, I gave the example that oh, the other guy got hurt. There was no other guy. Yeah. Right? It was just, we just thought there would be a longer <laughs> yeah. growth period and we yeah. didn't have it. And you're we, not going to say, come back in three months. No. Say, all right, you're here now. Let's ex- figure it out. Exactly right. Um, it, it's partly that. The other part of it is, and, and this is, in some ways, I have, I have envy for where you're at in your business right now at the age that your business is at. Yeah. Um, I love my business. I have no interest in trading my business for anybody else's. There's excitement to the early days of like, we're going to try this thing. Mm-hmm. And if it flops, no big deal at all. Just iterate. We still do that also. Um, but we're set up in such a way that we need the core things always to work. Yeah. If the core things fail, then we have problems. Yeah. So the core things always have to work and we can iterate on the core things in a multitude of ways and, oh, that didn't work. Okay, no big deal. Mm-hmm. The idea of being able to pivot the whole company <laughs> on a dime <laughs> is so in my personality. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So I have... I feel like that is an entrepreneurial trait. I remember, I don't know if it was an email I got or a group I met. I don't even know, but someone was just like... I feel like burning it all to the ground for the tenth time this year. Mm-hmm. I guess I'm on the right track. And I was like, Yeah. That's not just me. Because I want to burn the shit to the ground and walk away and, and build it again because it's so exciting to build. Mm-hmm. But then i I am in the place right now where it's like I am going through those feelings of wanting to burn it to the ground. And I'm just like, but there's good stuff here. So we're gonna have a controlled fire. Right. And we're going to pull out the things that we don't need, maybe put them in the cabinet for later. And we're really going to focus on the things that we do need and the things that work and that are great. And then we're going to rebuild. Well, part of what you're describing there is, I think, a characteristic of an an entrepreneur is we hate being bored. Yeah. So a boring (laughs) business is probably a good business. Yeah, yeah. Like my group program was successful. It was great. And I was just like, so we finally hit success. I'm done. Right. <laughs> like right. It's just, you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, that's, I, I think that's one of the most important things to resist as an entrepreneur is the urge to change things um, yeah. more than one degree at a time. Because how, how, can you, how can you measure growth? If you're constantly changing, you don't know what worked because you manipulated every single lever. That you're like, I want to believe it's this thing because I have an interest in that thing and mm-hmm. that's my bias. But yeah, it's, it's so true. If we don't give things time to flourish or fail, how do you know? I, and, and it's also the game of, look, I'm, let's say you're, you're a young, I'm not saying you, I'm saying the proverbial you now. You're at $15,000 and you finally hit it. Uh, and you're the only person in your company, $15,000 a month. What you can rest easy on, and one of the reasons why it's easy to make the changes that you shouldn't make is because you're like I'm not a, I'm not worried anymore. Like I can build a ten to fifteen million a ten to fifteen thousand dollar a month business anytime I want. I could do it selling tea. Mm-hmm. Like I, I now know the 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 levers to build that business. Mm-hmm. I don't know the levers to build the twenty five thousand dollar a month business. That's really hard. Let me build another ten or fifteen thousand dollar a month offer mm-hmm. and then another 10 to $15,000 a month offer. When I add those offers together, I'll have four offers at $15,000 a month, making me $60,000. That's amazing. What's, what's true about that. And unfortunate is managing those four things at the same time is a whole skill set that mm-hmm. you don't have, not you, the proverbial yeah. you that would allow you to have one $60,000 thing. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's, it's this mental gymnastics. I think it's because w- we are living in a world where everyone has a side hobby or a side hustle, whatever you guys call it. Um, or they rent a condo in Miami, film for two days and pretend they have one. <laughs> I, we're not talking about trust fund kids. I've got it. Okay. <laughs> but you're able to kind of chase your passion in a world where we were always told this is the box. You commute an hour to work, you do your job, you commute an hour home. And now you go on Instagram, you go on YouTube and you see other people doing things that you're interested in making money. And you're like, 
well, shit, I want to do that too. So you start and you're like, this is hard, but I still have that like puppy love, that initial excitement. And you're like, let's go, let's do it, let's do it. And then you make it to that hurdle and you're like, 10, 15 K, this is awesome. I don't want to do that again. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go back to square one. And I think that's why we see so many businesses that stay at that level or start and then fizzle out is because they, they don't have the resources or the interest to keep going. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's, hard when you have that like you were talking about you start the other business and you're like this is easy I'm just going to put it on autopilot some people can and they do really well at it but others are like I'm going to start the new thing now and then they're like what am I marketing what am I selling I don't know because I thought it was going to be as easy as the first one maybe my heart's not in it or maybe I'm chasing a dollar whereas the first time I wasn't chasing a dollar I was chasing a passion and then you're like how did I get here what advice would you give to the person who is currently in the job where they're not allowed to say anything they're making good money they can't imagine themselves doing this for the next 20 years but they also can't imagine getting off of it i would say start somewhere like keep following your passions and your interests and i'm not saying quit your job today but i think that wherever you're at you have to remember that you are in your own fishbowl So when I worked in sports, I made like 50, 60 K and I thought that was so cool because it was my first job out of college and I was like, look at me getting paid to go to games. (laughs) And then I worked for the tech company and I was making, I think like 98 K look at me. I'm in my twenties. I'm just at with the side gigs too. I make six figures. Look at me. Okay. But it's not about that. Like, great. You can pay your bills. Great. You can start saving now. Are you happy? Are you fulfilled? Because we always say that success is directly related to our bank account. And I think what being an entrepreneur has taught me is that's one of the things. But success is time freedom. It's being able to have a family, being able to be home for those milestones, being able to go on a run at three o'clock if I want to, being able to be here with you. And I would not, I was, I am not that person that was just like, I just woke up one day and said, forget it, I'm Mm -hmm. quitting. Some people do that and they can make it work and they're great. But I had to start slowly with it was just like, I'm going to get a runner's world subscription. I'm going to buy this running book. I'm really interested in this business book. I love these podcasts where I've got the millions of businesses in my head that I'm like, okay, so that could work. That could work. That could work. I'm building out the business plans. And then I'm like, two weeks later, I'm thinking about something else because it just wasn't interesting for me. So I say, follow your curiosities and see how long they stay with you. Because like crypto was really cool to me at one point. Don't ask me a question about it now because I have no idea. Could you imagine if I quit my job to start a a crypto startup? I'd be fucked. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Probably. Yeah, Yeah, I mean, yeah, okay, we won't go there, but. (laughs) Oh, I don't know anything about it. I know Bitcoin's a thing and that's about it. Yeah, my husband's into it and I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'll let you know when the mortgage is paid off. (laughs) Fair enough, that's good. Um, You said you're launching, not launching, but you said you're starting something in uh, soon. What are you starting? I'm starting a membership and I'm really excited about this because for me, anytime I hop on a call with someone that's interested in becoming a Mindful Miles athlete, the only reason they say no can you guess? I can guess what they tell you. Yeah. I don't okay. think that's the reason, yeah. but yes. So they tell you it's too expensive. It's too expensive. I can't afford it right now. Um, or, so that's the first thing. Or the other reason they never get on the call is because they don't feel worthy of having a coach. They feel like they need to be training for a specific race or they feel like they need to consider themselves a runner. And so they can't get past that first barrier. That's of, not unique to running. Correct. Just, just like, yep. I mean, that's in, in the world that we're in, there's a, there's a people who are like, yeah, like I'm not, I'm not rich. Like I'm not the kind of person who has a personal coach. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, there's a lot of that. Yeah. And so I am kind of just following the breadcrumbs here in which, okay, so you want community, you want to be inspired. You want these like interesting challenges where you can follow your curiosities. You can try new things. You can do it with women that are like-minded Let's create the membership where you can become a part of the Mindful Miles membership. You have access to our coaching calls. We'll do hot seat coaching. You get the monthly yoga. You get everything that a Mindful Miles athlete gets 
minus that one-on-one -on -one coaching because maybe that is just too much accountability for you right now, but you want to be in the room. And then mm -hmm. from there you get to decide, oh, yeah, no, no, no. I, I want to go further. I want this one-on-one -on -one attention. But the way that I look at it, because a lot of, a lot of the people that I work with are actively trying to break up with diet culture or they're in recovery from it. And they are constantly surrounded by friends, family members, coworkers that are just talking about their splat points and who can't have that. It's, I, I was bad this weekend. And so if we can create a community in which you're talking differently, you're hearing things, you're thinking differently, you're instantly elevating yourself. You're sur you are the people you surround yourself with. So if you can surround yourself with people who respect their bodies, who can acknowledge that I have a bad body image day and I'm not feeling great about myself, but I'm not going to go on a juice cleanse so I can <laughs> shit for the next three weeks because of it. Yeah, I think that is something worth investing and in, worth doing for your own mental health. So I'm excited to launch it again. We'll iterate if we need to, as we need to, but I think it's going to be really exciting. When does it go live? November. November. You don't know yet. November 1st, probably. Oh, wow. Whatever. Yeah, soon. Okay, so soon. Yeah. I'm excited. I, I'm interested to hear um, how that goes. Yep. I'm interested mostly because I want to I wanna learn about is the is the person who wants the one on one accountability? Uh, do they enjoy being in the room with the person who doesn't? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is it additive or yep. is it detractive? I'm, I'm I'm interested in learning that. Yeah, I'm interested too, and I think um, it's definitely going to be a follow up conversation. We're not going to hit it out of the park on the first try, but that's what's so cool about entrepreneurship is we take I take what I'm interested in and I take the feedback that I get from clients and prospective clients and mm -hmm. say. Okay, we can create something cool here. That's cool. Yeah. Sarah, anything you would like to share with the audience before we wrap? Uh, I think keep fighting to find your people. That is what entrepreneurship has really taught me is you are going to feel alone many days, especially if you don't have a team of 30, whatever you've got. Um, it is going to feel really weird to be like, like I just shared my past salaries. People don't do that. Mm -hmm. Like people don't like talking about money. Okay. Find, find the people that will find the people that will celebrate you for making your first sale from hitting your first milestone and they exist and they're out there. And I think as long as you have that community and I call it like your board of directors, you know who you're going to with business wins, you know who you're going to with personal wins. You build that out and just stay true to yourself. Have fun. See what happens. I love it. Where can they find you? I am on Instagram at I am Sarah Hayes. I'm online at mindfulmilesrunning.com. And that's pretty much it. Sarah with an H or no H? Sarah Hayes. So it's S-A-R-A-H-A-Y-E-S. -A -A uh, yeah, well, my whole life saying Sarah, no H. And now I'm like, oh, right. I'm Sarah well, with an H. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, if you're looking to get into running, if you're looking for a, a, an empowering community, I would highly advise you to take a look at what Sarah's got going on. Thanks. You're welcome. Turn pro. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Active Live Podcast. Please remember, give us a hand, rate it, review it wherever you listen to shows. We are on a mission to humanize the healthcare industry by professionalizing the fitness industry to empower the individual to live a life unlimited by the way that their body looks, feels, or performs. If you are inspired by that mission and want to jump on the wagon, find us anywhere. Active Life Professional on Instagram. Active Life RX on Instagram. Come to me personally at Dr. Sean Pastuch. We want to welcome you onto the train. We want you to be a part of the mission. We want to offer you the opportunity to pursue this right alongside us. We're inspired by your effort and we hope to help you in your journey. Turn broke.